came to Hong Kong, whenever they asked my son, uh, he was born in Malaysia, but uh, since he was three months, he, he grew up in China, right? So uh, we were in Shangri-La, you know, so every time people ask in Hong Kong, like, oh, where, where you guys came from? He'll say, oh, we are from Shangri-La. Uh, where is Shangri-La? I say, oh, in China. <laughs> okay, uh, so they told, then they came to me, oh, so, uh, we, you, so you work at the hotel Shangri-La, right? It's like, no, it's like a place called Shangri-La, there's no hotel there. It's like, no, your son said he's from Shangri-La. <laughs> I say, no, it's, it's a location, it's a place, there's no hotel there. And everything my son knew was China, you know? So every time they ask him, oh, where are you from? China. I thought your parents are from Malaysia. It's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I'm from China, you know? <laughs> so this is the thing, you know, he grew up, this they call the third, you know, the uh, third culture kid, you know? So he had a difficult time to adjust for, for some time. Anyway, we, uh, God began to speak to our hearts. Uh, just a little bit okay. Just I thought you want to take away my mic. No eh? problem. <laughs> it's too loud. You know, I just told you this morning, it's like we are, we are used to hold a mic. So, you know, in our church, we just walk around, right? So I say, your pastor, just fix it there so that nobody move. Especially the... <laughs> <laughs> no pastors move here, you know? Then how to keep you away? It's not my fault, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, we, it was a privilege uh, when we were seven years in China. Uh, I shared a bit in, a, you can listen to my first message. Ba basically, we, we, I came from a Hindu background uh, in when uh, about 25 years ago, right after I finished my high school. Uh, that's why I became to, came to know the Lord. And uh, throughout that time, like the first week I was in the church, I was sitting right behind and uh, there was a pastor, I told him uh, that he also had a long hair, you know, that's why I follow after him, you know, whoever prophesied over me, you know. <laughs> so anyway, he, he began to prophesy, like, oh brother on the back, can you come forward? I was like, oh okay, like, I just came forward so naively and then he, and he began to prophesy, you got a full-time calling, you know, God has called you into the full-time, I mean, one, one week Christian, right, never been to church before, like sitting there like, uh, what is he talking about? You know, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, I have no clue what he prophesied over me. You know? <laughs> and then good thing my pastor came around, he told me, oh, uh, Vic, don't, don't worry. Uh, you know, this uh, prophecy is not going to happen like tomorrow. Uh, you need to still go to your college, do your studies, you know, until right time God will call you, he will confirm. And throughout my studies, you know, I, I will start go growing in the church. I'm from... Uh, from Penang, that's the best state in Malaysia. Those who knows from Malaysia, they cannot deny that. When you have food, you control the mind and the stomach, right? So uh, that's where we control. Yeah, we control the food in Malaysia. So anyway, uh, I, I went to study in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, that's the time that God began to, you know, train me and, and uh, just teach me. But during those times, I really don't like to study. You know, we are in engineering. Both that's where we met actually, both of us, uh, and. Uh, Studying there, I always thought like, you know, this is the time I want to go to full-time ministry because I don't want to study, right? So I say, okay, God, right, I'm ready now to go, you know. But I graduated, I came back, was working as an engineer, slowly down the road, three, four years. And I slowly began to feel that, you know, I think it's, it's not going to happen, you know, let's, let's stop this. My, I mean, I, we, we were planning to get married and all that. But God was telling us it's not the right time yet. I'm like, oh, okay, so when is the right time? We still were praying like the right time, you know. And God began to speak to my heart, like, you know, this is the time that uh, you need to go. So, like, you know, now you're making money, right? So you're planning, and then, like, God say that, okay, I, ne I need you to uh, leave your job and then go to YWAM. Have you heard of YWAM? It's a youth of the mission. And uh, from there, it was not an easy choice for me to go, you know, and then because we already had a lot of plans, but uh, God began to change things around, you know. But amazingly, when we were in the YWAM, we, we continued to... Uh, uh, study there for four years and after finish uh, God began to speak to our heart to go to this place called uh, uh, Yunnan in Shangri-La and uh, as we were praying I said God I, I don't have any language capacity I mean like I don't speak uh, Mandarin you know I, I speak a bit of Hokkien uh, but that is like you know to scold people you know not like really converse with people you know what do you do you know you just but I say God I why do I go there and I finish my Bible school and then you go to send me to a place that I cannot speak their language and all that you know but thank God my wife speaks fluent Mandarin and every time we go there everywhere in China I tell them don't worry about me no matter what happened I will not leave you nor forsake you because I don't understand what they're saying if you're not here I'm not going to understand what they're talking to me you know so I need to explain all the way but anyway we God began to open doors we do a, a, like church planting up there 
And uh, after seven years, we were there. Uh, we got open doors to, to come to Hong Kong because we were praying like we want to further our studies. As we were praying and God began to, I just thinking, you know, just calculating the cost. I think, oh, Philippines were the best place because there's the assemblies of God in Baguio. And we thought like, that would be a good place. Everybody said Baguio is beautiful. And like, so we were really planning, you want to go there. And God said, no, uh, I got an open door for you to in Hong Kong, you know. But first thing you're thinking about the cost and like living here is so expensive. But God said, you know, I who call you, I am faithful and I'm going to provide for you. Amen. So, and we say, okay, God, if it's you, then we're just going to step out by faith, you know. So when we came, I didn't like it. You know, I came 10 years ago to Hong Kong uh, just for a day. You know, I said, you know, I'm not going to come back to this place again. I said, that's a dangerous prayer. Don't ever pray that, you know. <laughs> now I'm already six years. Next year, I'll probably get my resident already, you know. <laughs> so can you imagine the place you say, don't want to come back and God bring you back again. Uh, amazing that we, we only planned to be here six, uh, three years and then after we finish our studies we say we're going to go back to China, China again you know uh, but God began to change things around you know if you have told me from the beginning that you're going to be here a bit a longer time than what I decided uh, I probably have not even left China you know but uh, God always has his plan you know sometimes we don't know everything we won't know everything, but the, the thing is that to be faithful in what He's giving to you right now. Amen? And, and He will begin to open the door. Sometimes we want to know everything, you know, like just God give it like A to Z, and then I will respond. No, it doesn't work that way, you know. But uh, today's my message is to talk about stubborn faith. Repeat after me, stubborn faith. Yeah, so you might say like, what do you mean like stubborn faith? Stubborn is bad, you know. <laughs> but I will explain to you in, in what way can you be stubborn. And uh, we're going to uh, read a couple of scriptures together. Will you be okay? Yeah, so uh, let's read uh, from uh, Daniel chapter 3. It's a story about the three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if you have the words there, okay. So can we read together, right? All right. Okay, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubit high, 60 cubit wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satrap, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he has set up. Then go to verse 16. Yeah? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, a God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and if he deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And the satrap, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor their hairs of the head sinned. And their robes were not scorched, and there were no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their life rather than to serve or worship any other gods except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nations or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut off into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for there is no other gods can save in in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. You know, how many of you know this story? You know, you probably heard it in the Sunday school up to now. You know, it's, it's a really a famous story that we all heard. You know, that, uh, how many of you have experienced that you feel like at times, that whether in your workplace or in your schools or in your marketplace, wherever you, like you are being set up to someone like try to trap you. You know, that uh, you have felt like you've been pushed to a corner where you, you can't really respond because there, there's not much on your side to defend. You know, I personally have experienced that many a times. But today I'm talking about how to have a stubborn foot even during those difficult times. Okay, let me ask the first question is that how many of you are not stubborn here? <laughs> really? Only one? Okay. You better get life. We are all stubborn in some ways. You know, <laughs> some have a little bit stubborn. Uh, some I call it um, 
a little bit very stubborn, and some uh, a few maybe extremely hopelessly stubborn. You know, <laughs> so you know, yeah, different degree in your stubbornness, right? You know, I, and I began to find uh, just Google the the meaning of uh, uh, stubborn. It says that having or showing dutch determination not to change one's attitude or position on something especially in, sight, in spite of good reason to do so someone who does not listen to other people's opinion uh -huh. a stubborn person always thinks he's right hallelujah well <laughs> often associated with arrogance and acting all-knowing difficult to change move remove or cure wow can you imagine i can hear that you know husband and wife like Shh, you see this you you know, it happens anyway. You know, being stubborn is is uh, it's not wrong. You know, it's just one of the characters we all have in within us. You, you need to be stubborn in some ways. But today I'm going to talk about uh, there's a kind of a good stubborn and and there's a wrong kind of stubborn. We're going to look at the wrong kind of stubborn. You know, the story of uh, if you've seen in uh, Genesis chapter 11 verse 6. I think I have the okay. Just going to read a couple of passages here. It says that the Lord says. In verse 6, it says, As one people speaking in the same language, they began to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Wow. This is what God is saying about humans. You know, he created us, right? And can you imagine, He's just edifying us. But in the, one way, in the other way, He says that, if you, if you look at the last part, He says that, so that they want to build so that we may make a name for ourselves. And not be scattered all over the world. I mean, like, they were purpose to build this Babel, Tower of Babel, is we can make name for ourselves. That is a wrong kind of stubbornness, I would say. The determination is right. They want to come together to build something, but it's not to glorify God, but to glorify themselves. You know, whenever you see this thing happen, you know that it should alarm you because your stubbornness will either lead you for your to excel, to success, or for your destruction or fall. So it's very important that, uh, that sometimes we are so stubborn that we don't even give a place for God to even move or do something. You know, when you say that when you are stubborn, that means you have made up your mind that no matter what, whoever is going to tell you something, you're not going to listen. Even it could be a good reason, a good advice for you, but we will say that we're not going to listen because we already made up our mind. So it could be in a good way that you want to stand for what you believe or in a bad way such a way that you you're just not going to give in at all hmm you're quiet right <laughs> you know basically it's acknowledging god's control over your life that how sovereign he is over your life it's true kind of today i'm going to focus on faith the stubborn faith but based on god's word this word they call rema that means it's a spoken word of God, Rema. Say Rema. Rema. You know, you guys are big on, on word of God, right? Here I know that Pastor Rene is, is really good with Bible studies and all that. I really appreciate him. <laughs> you know, thanks if you're watching online. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> but you know, I also they call the Logos. It's, it's a written word of God. You know, the, this is the written word of God. But at times where God will still speak to you, either from the Bible or something that different not in the Bible but it still confirms certain things in your life and this is called that it's for that season for that timing that you needed the most and God will begin to speak something to you this is what we call the Rema word of God you say faith in God's word combined with human will it's an unbeatable combination it's so important that our faith began to grow you know faith is like it's like a muscle everybody show your hands Put it this way, you know, you, you go for gym, right? You know, you, you, if in order for your muscles to grow in your body, uh, you, you need to exercise, right? I think some of you, God is speaking to you, you need to start exercising, right? But I exercise, but I kind of, you know, being a Malaysian, it's kind of hard, you know, we talk about food and whenever we meet. How many Malaysians are here? No, only one, two? Wow. Okay. <laughs> we had more Malaysians this morning. So every time we get together, I don't know why, for some reason, we just always talk about food. You know, but anyway, uh, we began to know that if you, without exercising, your muscles cannot grow. And faith is that way; it just doesn't happen. And sometimes God will will take us through different uh, situation in our in our life to see that our our muscles, these faith muscles, are continually grown. Amen. So sometimes we don't despise 
where you are today. It might not look good to you, but remember, when you, one day when you look back, you will know that God has taken you through. Hallelujah. Amen. So the first thing is that we knew that from these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a faith that kind of uh, really amazed me. You know, when I was reading this passage, like the first thing came that, wow, this is the stubborn faith that I like. And you know that Nebuchadnezzar began to set up this uh, image of gold. It's about 90 feet high. It's about, you say, nine story high. And he said, when the music plays, everyone must bow down and worship the image he has placed. And he threatened, if, no, if anyone does not worship this idol that he has placed, they will be thrown into the fiery furnace. Is that a serious thing? Yes. Right. I mean, like, you're going to lose your life, right? It's better I just bow down and then just get, you know, God will forgive me. It's like, <laughs> who cares? But these guys, you know, they knew the risk that was coming before them. And they paid no attention at all. I mean, you are, you are being a kind of, you are taken into like as a slave into another country, basically in Babylon. You know, Jerusalem is totally destroyed. And these guys, uh, they are living in another country under somebody's support. And then here they are standing to say that, you know, although you are feeding us, we are under your supervision and all that, but still we cannot choose to do something that is against our God. Say, we cannot stand for not, that is not from God. Because every Hebrew, they know that they will not worship any other idols except the Jehovah God. And here they say that even you can set up this. I don't care. I'm not going to bow down to this. The first thing is that I say that, that your faith should not be negotiable. He says that, they answer the king in verse 16. They say that, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. This is stubborn. You know why? Because they already made a deal in their mind to say that there's no negotiation right now to talk to you because we have made our mind that we will not worship any other gods. That there's nothing to talk right now. And they're telling the king, oh Nebuchadnezzar, okay, not king Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, hear this, there's nothing to talk, we already made our mind, we're not going to worship this God, uh, this idol that you place there. Even they know they were confronted with a fiery furnace coming in front of them. Is that been a time that uh, you've been slammed with such a bad news that you just don't know what's going to happen next? You know, so nowadays you just hear like, I, I don't know, I've just been hearing so many people like, I won't say like so many, but it just every few weeks once I'm hearing like somebody having a cancer. One of their loved ones, uh, their children, their husbands or wife. You know, it becomes like a flu, like, you know, just. But it's not easy for someone to suddenly hear their loved one being affected with a sickness and then. Not only that, it's not about sickness, but it's just the time they're giving them. They say that you have number of months, weeks, days, or years to live. That is the hardest part, you know, when you see your loved one need to be departed from you. At times you've been told that by your employer, say that it's time, I need to let you go. For some reason that I cannot explain to you, or sometimes they tell you to your face, this is the reason I don't like you, you need to go. Even you have done your best to please your master, please your employer, but they still say, you need to go. I have no reason to keep you here. What do you do during those times? How do you respond to this kind of situation? Now, my dad uh, taught me how to drive a car. But the thing is that when I, when I drive, I was driving, you know, he always sit beside me, but his hands are always on the steering, you know, the handbrake. You know, you have a handbrake. <laughs> Some cars now it's on your leg. That one you cannot control. But you know, our car. It's you know, he's always. I'm like, why are you holding the handbrake? You know, I uh, I trust my car, but I don't trust you. <laughs> so if anything happened, I need to pull the handbrake. You know, right? You know, to stop. Right. The thing is that we all have some ways a handbrake that we carry. You know, even we say, God, we we have faith in you. We will follow you. But at times we just. When God is doing something halfway through, you say, God, I'm not going to go through this, God. You know, I'm putting my handbrake. I have to go back to what I know. I, want, I don't want to go through. 
what you have before me. Like I mentioned to you, you know, we, we came to, to Hong Kong in the uh, year 2009. We had our open doors to come and study in Hong Kong. And God was just amazing. He, he just, you know, get all the sponsors. We were fully sponsored to study here. And uh, down the road, about in 2011, what happened is that, you know, we all began to cough in our family, in the, in the whole Bible school. Everybody, like everywhere you turn, MTI, everybody was coughing in that time, you know. Uh, some kind of virus or bacteria was going through. You know, people were coughing for months. I coughed for a month actually, you know, then kind of slowed down and then my son picked up and then came to my wife. By the time came to my wife, uh, it was so serious that she started, you know, she couldn't breathe anymore. Her body was so weak that uh, we tried everything, you know, went like three times to the, to the doctors. It just won't stop. But came to a place where, because my wife kind of phobia with, with hospitals right now, you, you know, you know that when you go in there, at least two hours you have to wait before you even get treated, you know. But the thing was that she just kind of phobia, she don't want to go into the hospital and say like, so I say like, no, you, you, are, you are not able to breathe well already, so I, I need to bring you into the hospital. So she said, okay, give me one more day. I still remember it was April the 13th. Say, give me one more, one more day. If I really couldn't breathe, the next day you can take me to the, to the hospital. So, okay, that night, and I saw that she was getting really bad. That She couldn't breathe anymore. She was really struggling. And I just hold her and pray with her and, and uh, began to sing. And I even fall asleep at night, you know, because the night is the worst time. She would just keep coughing and coughing. But in the midnight, when she, she was really couldn't breathe anymore, she began to pray to God. and said, God, I, th I think my time is up. Just, just take me home. Can you imagine, we are both studying at the Bible school, seminary. By now you should have amazing faith, right? Yeah. <laughs> when things really hit you, when they slam you on the face, sometimes whatever you will learn in the Bible school, even from the Bible, sometimes they don't, don't come into, into existence already. Because you're just focusing on, on your suffering, on your circumstances, and then we don't see anything else. Even for Bible school students. <laughs> We are human, that's, that's make us human. And that's why it's called faith, because this is the journey God is taking us through. So she prayed, God, I think it's time, I, I want to go home, take me home, because she couldn't breathe anymore. And right after she said that, God began to speak to her from Psalms 118 verse 17. Say that you, you shall not die, but live, and you will proclaim my goodness. Can you imagine, she couldn't breathe, you know, she wanted to die, but God said, you will not die, but live. <laughs> and that, that night when, when she couldn't so the next morning when I woke up we, I, I took my I let my son go to school the next day next moment I called the taxi straight away bring her to the to the uh, Chun, uh, Yun Long hospital because somebody said better don't bring to Chun, Chun Moon you know I don't know why but they say so I went to the Pok Hoi hospital brought, brought in there they went and took her to the x-ray and all that they came back to me I said we, we suspect it's a lung cancer it's like wow I thought like I was still dreaming you know like what are you talking about? You know, like, there's no history of lung cancer in my family or my wife's family side. But, you know, suddenly to say that you have a lung cancer, it was a bit of shocking to us, you know. And he said that uh, we have, we don't know what to do, but, but we're just going to bring her to the ICU. So they just brought her inside. And I went inside to just say, ask the permission, can I, can I just pray for her? You know, just by the time they gave her a shot, I don't know what she said, suddenly she started having, the whole body was burning inside her. And she just kind of went into a coma. And that's the last I spoke to my wife. And now, then they just, uh, we thought, okay, just going to take just a couple of days, you know, we'll be fine, you know, just keep praying. The next day they call me, they say, uh, you know, it's kind of serious. I think it's time that you can inform your, your relatives, your friends, come because she won't survive, she's going to die. Both her lungs collapsed, basically, it's full of fluid and uh, infection was so bad, they said, we, we, we cannot revive her. So they say, we don't know what to do. We're just putting on, on like 100% oxygen support on her. She's on a ventilator. And we say that we'll just wait. Wow, you know, just to tell you to wait, don't know what to do, you know. And uh, what do you do during those times? So I just kind of just waiting and just thinking, you know, what, what other option we have. Seems like there's no other option. So I went back home the next mo morning, early morning, they called me, okay, wait, uh, can, can you come to the hospital? I said, oh man, you don't want to hear, you know, whenever they call you, you just hated that, you know. Every time you hear, when you get a call from the hospital, you think that this is going to be a bad news, right? It sounded like bad news. They say, okay, we, we have a solution, but uh, it's, 
we don't know whether it's going to work, but we're going to try. So can you come over to the hospital? Went in there, they said, we're going to put her on a, on an ammo machine. It's a, it's a lung bypass, basically. They put her on an oxygen, basically, uh, it's breathed for her. You know, it pumps in, the blood out, oxidize, and then pump it back. And she's on these two machines all over her. You know, I, I don't know if we had a picture of that. Yeah, look at that. She's all over, cabled out, you know, she's gone. I mean, like, either they say that, you know, we have uh, about one hour to perform this operation to put this machine on her, you know, to cable her. And then said, there's no guarantee that she will survive. There's a chance she can lose her life during this operation. It's going to take about one hour. And not only that, if she survived that, we need to move her from Yunlong to Chai Wan, Pamela, uh, Pamela yeah, Houston, Eastern Hospital. And it was Saturday. They said there's traffic jam during the lunch hour, so just you know, we, we'll try everything, you know, the best we can, you know. So they went in to took her. I said, okay, can we give her some time to pray? Or something? Yeah, okay, I'll give you five minutes to decide. You know, so basically we knew that this is what the Lord wanted us to. So I said, okay, go ahead. But 45 minutes, they're able to perform the operation. It was successful. And then they said, we need to move her now. Say, so you go ahead first to to, one, uh, to Taiwan. By the time we get there, we got to the, the Hung Ham, the Cross Harbor Tunnel. It was jammed. I'm like, oh, man, because... They were already giving her 100% support at the hospital and she just barely surviving. Moving her into the ambulance, taking her to the other way, about one hour or more than one hour drive. I said, we don't know what's going to happen, you know. But amazing, by the time I got there to the Wan Chai, sorry, Chai Wan, <laughs> and the ambulance just came right behind. We were like, how come we could be so fast? You know, we took like such a long time. They said, no. They had two police escort on the motorbike to take the ambulance on the other side, you know. So they cleared the way, you know. They said, like, this is so rare in, in Hong Kong that they will do this, you know. <laughs> but amazing, you know, God just opened the door. And then by the time she got there to, to Chai Wan, uh, they put her in into ICU. They said, now we wait. Wow. So I said, okay, uh, how long do you know? Like, no, you just wait. That means, wait means just wait, you know. So you thought like, okay, it's going to be take like few days, you know. She'll be, she'll be okay, you know. One, two days, one week, two weeks. It didn't stop. It just keep going on every day, you know. Every day I'm going there, just waiting there that somehow she'll get revived. But she's just not moving at all, like just vegetable, you know. So, uh, and every day they just tell me that, she will not survive. She's going to die. At the same time, I began to remember that, you know, the scripture that my wife got is like, you shall not die but live and proclaim my goodness. I'm thinking like, my goodness, like, it doesn't even tally with what God has said, with the, what is the doctor is saying. He says, she, she's going to die anytime. She's not going to survive. You know, they began to treat this bacteria. And then not only that, after they treat, after two weeks, there's another bacteria affected her. Because she's in ICU, right? So just like all the germs you can find is out there, you know. And then she had another bacteria attack, like third one. And then she had virus in her lungs. And after they treated the virus, she had this micro bacteria or something. And when she's done with that, they said there are fungus growing on her lungs. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> it's like Hong Kong houses, right? There's so many things growing there. It's like everything growing inside her lung. So they say like, oh, although she's still surviving this, but they keep telling her that she's not going to survive this. And the only thing I remember because of the word that had been spoken to my wife, I just remembered I will stand on that word that God has spoken. I couldn't remember everything else I remember learning in the Bible school. But the only thing I remembered was God spoke to her that you should not die but live and proclaim it. I said, God, I don't know if you are saying that, you know, in the spiritual stance that she's going to live in heaven and in life. But how you testify his goodness when you are in heaven? My goodness. <laughs> but I still stand on that promise. God, no matter what, what the doctor is saying, I, I trust the doctor they are saying. They are telling the truth because I can see her lung is pretty bad. It's just white, you know, it's like just white shadow, you know. Every day they say, this is bad. You know, they are trying to explain it. But somehow God began to give me this peace I cannot explain when I was was there. Real peace. I began to experience this peace. I cannot, you know, that's why in Philippians it says, right, do not be anxious. Do not worry. You know, to worry is so normal. You learn right now, right? You know, to worry is nothing amazing to worry. Everybody worry in this world. But not to worry, not to be anxious 
it takes you to be a supernatural person to do that. Amen? Amen. And that only can happen when you have your faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that's why I began to experience, it's like, you know, a, a mental block on your, on your, on your brain, you know, right? When you begin to worry and all that, you know, you, you cannot see anything else around you because everything you see is your situation, your circumstances. But when you begin to say that, God, I'm just going to release it to you. Take over, take control. For 40 days, every day they will just tell me the same thing again and again. She will not survive. I even had a friend came over because he's a, a, a local friend from Hong Kong. The doctor began to explain in Cantonese everything to the, to the doctor, uh, to the, my friend. And then he came, he's like, wow, that's so serious. He came and explained to me. I said, uh, my friend, the doctor actually spoke perfect English. I understood every word he said. I know the risk, you know. So, yeah, but you are not responding. Uh, how do you want me to respond? He said, I didn't respond to what they said. They're going to die. So, I was like, yeah, but what what can I do? You know, if they have said there's no solution, just wait, she's going to die. But what can I do? But I said, because of the word that's given to me, I, I began to have some kind of faith in me. I would say that the stubborn faith or stubborn faith on the promises God has given to my wife. I said, you know what? I'm going to stand whatever promise that God given her and I'm going to, not going to let go. And I tell you, whenever you're going through difficult time, struggles, hard time, Job's friends always comes around you. <laughs> you know, he had some good friends, right? They, they come around there and say, Job, you, you probably... You know, exactly the same thing. Some friends came around, you know, they came and then they told me, you know, Vic, I think you are to be blamed. <laughs> so like, I don't create bacteria to infect on my wife. <laughs> we, we live together, right? It's like, but he was going around everywhere, you know. I didn't create this bacteria. But I said, yeah, you didn't take care of her well. That's why she's sick. She's, she's, she's in the hospital now. You know, I just couldn't defend. And I, what can you do? You know, it's like, yeah, I, right, yeah, I, I, I probably. And then another friend came, you know, I think there's some kind of sin in your wife's life, you know. I think you, you need to <laughs> repent, cut off this thing, you know, like cut off something, you know. I don't know what they want to cut off. But they say like, you know, like, like you, you stand on behalf of your wife, confess all the sin, your fathers, your grandfathers, your great-grandfather, <laughs> not even knowing what the heck they have done out there, you know. <laughs> but the thing is that they came around, right, they, you know, when they're, Sometimes they just don't know what to say. They want to say something. And I, this morning I said, sometimes they talk nonsense to you, right? You feel like it's better they have not said something rather than just be quiet, you know. If you know that somebody is going through some difficult time, take this advice. If you don't have nothing good to say, don't say anything. <laughs> Amen. Because <laughs> many a time, it might not be really helpful to you, you know. I'm like, I have to carry this, you know, all my life now, you know, like all these words I've heard, you know. <laughs> I say, I, I, I know my wife, who she is, you know. I, there's no sin that I need to confess. If you need to feel like you want to confess, you go ahead. Say, <laughs> <laughs> God has forgiven me. He, he don't forgive halfway. It's like, okay, I give you a little bit of forgiveness, and then you confess more, I give you a bit more, you know. No, it's once and for all. Even if it's in the Old Testament, when they brought the sacrifice, if it can forgive them for one year, how about Jesus' blood? He cleansed you once and for all. Amen? Amen. We're not perfect yet, but we are, we are being perfected, right? We are becoming more like Jesus. Now you know why I have a long hair. Because when I was Hindu, I mean, <laughs> you know, I explained to you how it's all related, right? When I was, was a Hindu, you know, you know there's Joha witness come around our place, you know, they like to give this. And, and I really actually enjoy uh, reading the, what do you call, the, the tower? Uh, what do you call, no? Watchtower. Watchtower, right? The magazine. Even now, you know, when I, when I go through the, the bridge and all that, they're always standing. They say, hey, can I get a magazine? I like to read their magazines. <laughs> I say, okay, you know, they give it to me. And they all give me the picture of Jesus, you know, so I keep that. You know, you know as a Hindu, you know, we, can, we have all the gods, right? So the more gods you have, it's better for you. It's more protection. Yeah, yeah. There's no such thing that like you follow one God, right? The more you have, it's like you, you are pretty protected. Because each God covers different area of your life, right? So they say, you have Jesus. Okay, yeah, no problem. It's free, you know, why not? You're right, they say Jesus is free, right? You don't need to think about anything. Else. But they say it's free. So I, I say, okay, have the picture. 
I always had this picture, you know, this see Jesus like. And they, when I became a Christian, they said, you need to become like Jesus. What do you think I remembered? Jesus in that picture had a long hair. <laughs> you can't blame me. I was naive, you know, from growing up. I saw Jesus all the and they said, you need to become more like Jesus. I'm like, I, first thing I know that I can work outward, why? So I just start growing my hair. <laughs> no problem, my hair is still growing. But I have other reasons. I will explain some other days. But I began to do this, you know, like every day when they, when they began to tell me all this thing, the only thing that stands is the word of God. And next thing was the word from John 10, verse 10. It says that the devil come to steal, kill, and destroy. But why Jesus came to do? He came to give you life, life more abundant. You know, that's why some people need to break this theology you have that God give you sickness. I say, I don't know how you get that in the New Testament. If you have, I mean, I, I'm in the Bible school, but I'm still studying, I'm doing my MDiv now. There's not one place that when Jesus walked on earth, that he have called someone who looks so perfectly, oh, you look so perfect, come over here. Take some leprosy. Yeah. Learn some lesson. Then when you call on the name of God, you know, I will come and heal you. No, he went around healing people, delivering from their sickness and disease, from misery. He always delivered people. He never put people in misery. So when someone going through difficult, then don't tell, yeah, there's some sin, you, you, you know, you deserve it. <laughs> some might be, I mean, you know, you can see something is so obvious, right? <laughs> You're doing something, and I'm not talking about those things, but certain things you just don't know. So you don't start judging people before, you know, you, you know what's really they're going through. And even every day, you know, I just confess this word, you know, God, you're not a life taker, you're a life giver. I mean, there are time for people that, you know, sometimes it's time for them to, to be with the Father, it's time to go. You can't do much, right? But like these three guys, Shadrach, Misha, and Abigail, I will just say this one thing, God, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that bad thing doesn't happen to you. You need to get that once for all. Because some people are going to preach, oh, you come to Jesus, everything will be gone. There's no such thing. I'd be like, the more problems you have, actually. <laughs> the day I became, gave my life, I was like, wow, how come I'm suffering more than before? <laughs> Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you won't go through difficult times. When rains fall, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that it doesn't rain on you. It's like, wow, it doesn't rain on me. Everybody is wet. You have a special protection. No, you still have to carry your umbrella, right? <laughs> it's going to come on anybody else. It doesn't matter. This is a fallen world. But God doesn't have to give you this to teach you a lesson. But when it happens, God will make a way to find a way to bring you out of that. Amen? Amen? And that's where we are. You know, no matter every day when they say, I begin to confess, God, you're not a life taker, you're a life giver. And you say that you promise that my wife will not die but live. That's all I stand. And that's kind of gave me a, some kind of boldness, a courage to stand against whatever they've been saying to me. I preach during, during the hospital. Everybody come in, they're like, oh, I can't see your wife. You know, she's like so bad. I'm like, okay, can I pray for you now? <laughs> like, just start praying for them, you know. Began to minister to them. I'm like, wow, like, you know, how come you're, 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 you're still smiling, you know? There's one night that, that, you know, they keep saying that, you know, I say like, you know, Sometimes this is what the devil wanted you to do. When things began to happen, he wanted you to curse God and then just, just leave God. This is what he wanted you to do. When things began to happen, he always wanted you to blame God. It's just like a common trick. Like that's the, like the lowest trick he can make and people buy into this. How come Jesus, like you know, they say you're a life giver and this can happen to me. I say if anybody has a credential, I have a right to have this credential. I was an engineer, my wife was a lecturer. When God began to call us in uh, year 99, we left our job. He said, that God, we're going to go full-time ministry. Not even having any support. He said, God, I don't know how this is going to happen, but we're going to step out by faith. But we saw the four years we were studying in YWAM and, and working with them. God provided everything. And not only that, right after that, God began to speak to us. I want you to now move to China. We're like, what? We just married, not even finished one year yet. Just seven months. God said, go to China. Now I was really struggling. God is like, why me, God? is like, can you see my color? 
I know through the clouds and all that, you see me like white holiness, you know. But I'm Indian, right? I'm not going to go to China. I don't speak a word of Chinese. I was really struggling. There even many times after we moved to China, that uh, the place was so cold. You know, right in Shangri-La, it's, uh, it's about, during winter, you can get about minus 12 to 15. And remember, there's no central heating there. You have a small heater, everybody just stay around there, you know, like, you just have to, we live in the living room, right? We have four bedrooms, big ones, like nearly 1,800 square feet big. I mean, like, it's cheap, right, <laughs> in China. But the thing was that it was so cold that, you know, sometimes you feel like, God, why you bring us here? Why not you bring the Tibetans to Hawaii or something, you know? It's nicer there, you know, why suffer this? Way? I, not even preaching the gospel yet, but you just going through the daily life there, you just six months of a year, it's just cold. I'm from Penang, it's really hot, you know, it's just hot, there's no season. Hot, hot, hotter, hottest, like, you know, it just got hot, you know. <laughs> it was so cold that, you know, it was really, there are many times that we, I wouldn't want to turn away. I told my wife because I couldn't speak the language. No matter what happened, please don't leave me because I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to understand what they are talking to me. You know, if you don't interpret or translate, I don't understand these guys, you know. <laughs> so don't worry, I'm not going to leave you. I will stay with you, you know, but make sure you are with me. So all this has struggled and then even going through this thing and then God said, now come to Hong Kong. You know, we just kind of being obey, obedient to God and all that. I said, God, I want to, I can even say, I want to say, I want to go to Baguio. Why you bring me to Hong Kong? <laughs> you know, this is what I say. I, I have this credential. I can question God. But I choose not. Friends came around to a hospital. They said, have you asked why? Oh, yeah. I said, that's a question I never actually asked. Why? Why my wife going through this? Why I'm going through this? Why, why, why? Tell me why. We, because we want everything, right? Here, like, you know, you demand things, you, you ask. And then when you come to God, you treat the same thing. God has right over our life. We don't have right, actually. <laughs> but God's still graceful. He can still answer us. He, he still comes around us, put his arms around us. He knows as a, as a human being, we are weak. That's why we really need God in our life. And I tell you, I began to just claim that word every day. Say, God, I just still going to stand on word. After 40 days, my wife woke up. The amazing part is that, I mean, later I'm going to have my wife quickly share her, her part in where, what she went through. But this part I like to share this morning. I forgot to share about that. But during that 40 days, my wife was in heaven. Right after I left her at the hospital, she, she went into a coma. She said the next moment she woke up, she was wearing a white gown, white dress. And she was right before this like really peaceful, bright place. And then she saw a throne. Do you believe that it's been a throne room of God? And she saw someone sitting there. Right away, my, my wife knew there was a father. You know, some people have this mindset like father, you know, he's a heavenly father, he's with a beard, you know, like Topekong, you know, like this Chinese God, you know, like, you know, this God, like, you know. No, he said he looks young and, you know, but he couldn't see that his face. It was so glorious that his body was shining that it just lighting up the whole heaven. And my wife said that it was really a peaceful place, uh, really, a, you know, she was just like a little kid, you know, like just enjoying that in that present. But when he came closer to her, you know, he said that I can just feel love. The first word he said that, daughter, you are highly favored. And God reminded her again that, you know that he took her around, showed different parts of heaven. And after that, he said that, my wife said, oh, can I stay here? <laughs> the Lord reminded her, do you remember I, I told you that you're not going to die, but live and proclaim my goodness. You need to go back to talk to them about my goodness. Now I know why it take 40 days for, you know, we are waiting there. My wife's like, ah, oh, can I stay back here? You know, we are like <laughs> struggling like, God, like, <laughs> what's happening? Like, why taking such a long time? But my wife says, such a short time, you feel like, you don't even feel like it was long. But, you know, but being in God's presence, that's, a, that's the best. There. There's no time zone, right, in heaven. But it's more like my journey with God. You know, she was like kind of really like a vegetable there. You know, like if you pull out any of the plugs, she's gone already. But it was more like my journey to have this faith, to say that, God, no matter what, I'm still going to stand on your word. And after 40 days, 
my wife woke up. Wow, look at that, it's already. And then the next one, you see that, although my wife was on a wheelchair for nearly three months, but it was, her journey begins, her real suffering begins after that time. The second thing is that your faith in Christ should be stubborn and restful. You know, it's important when you're going through difficult time, your mind is not in rest, your heart is not in rest. Because bad news doesn't give you peace, right? Bad news makes you to feel bad. You don't feel good. But there's a secret in that. Being a child of God, there, there's something different in you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. He can change things around you. That's why the, the scripture in Philippians say that do not be anxious or do not worry. And they say with prayer and supplication. And then at the end he said, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding be upon you. We pray all the time. We say, God, give me peace so that I don't worry. I don't be anxious. But Paul said that, no, you do your part. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Then the peace of God. Because you are the one who is blocking. You have the key. You have the right to choose how you want to respond to your situation today. You want to be restful or unrestful. It's amazing, something amazing just a year ago happened. I'd like to uh, invite my wife to come and share her part. Come, like, shall we give a round of applause to her? Welcome her. <laughs> yeah, last year, um, actually it's 2013, uh, I received a prophecy through a pastor. The prophecy is, the Lord said, I will have a second child. So, in my heart, I told the Lord, oh God, it's impossible, you know. My health is, um, you know, uh, still weak and not really strong yet. <laughs> then I say, God, give me two years, you know. After two years, I think I'm ready. But then last year, 2014, um, God kept reminding me uh, through a dream, you know, and then through my son. So I knew that uh, God reminded me to, uh, to prepare me that I'm going to have a second child. So, so in August, I found out uh, uh, I'm pregnant and then, um, but that time I was in Malaysia. So uh, we went, I went to check up and the doctor told me, you know, with your condition, I am really worried. Do not know whether you can carry a, this child or not. You know, so, so what happened was, uh, before my son and my husband left the clinic, and this doctor suddenly said, unless, unless God give you a miracle, you know. I said, wow, so I stand for it. So what happened was, came back to Hong Kong, you know, went for checkup in Twin Moon. <laughs> so the doctor found out my blood pressure a bit high, so they admitted me. And what happened was, they examined me, you know, for that 10 days. <coughs> so they said, oh, uh, Pao Yun, uh, we suggest that you have to abort this child. Yeah, because you only have a uh, one-third lung function ability, you know. So it's impossible. Y you, uh, you can carry this child, you know, in your womb. <coughs> so... Uh, for that, uh, until on the Wednesday, I said, God, these doctors, you know, every day, different doctors came, encouraged me to abort the child. <coughs> then I said, God, uh, you know, I couldn't take it anymore. You have to make a decision. Because uh, the doctor said, if you want this child, you have three possibilities will happen to you. First, you might die. Second, you and your child will die. Or third, your child will become retarded. <coughs> because of uh, lack of oxygen, myself. So, uh, after that, I was so worried. You know, I said, God, uh, you have to talk to me. Give me your decision. So on that Wednesday night, you know, after my 
uh, dinner in the hospital. So uh, I pray. And God showed me Mark chapter 8 and also Matthew chapter 14. So I read Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 is talking about Jesus fed 4,000. Matthew is uh, Jesus fed 5,000. So God told me this. You know, I had uh, took you out from dead, you know, to become alive, you know. And for this situation, it's just an easy job. You know? How come you say I am lack of, uh, uh, you, you adopted, you know, my, uh, you know, uh, his uh, authority, you know. So, say, oh, I'm so sorry, God. Hi. You know, I didn't trust you in this area. So after that, he talked to me this. I said, God, I will go ahead with what you promised me. So a Friday, the, the eight doctors uh, came together, had a meeting with us. And uh, the doctor asked me, so what is your decision? I said, I will go ahead. And then they said, okay, I'm so sorry. I cannot take you. This hospital cannot take you in. So you have to go somewhere. <coughs> so what happened? Uh, one of the doctors suggested I can call uh, uh, a Prince of Will, you know, to, to find a doctor, see whether they can take me in. So after that, he, she came back. She reported that, oh, you're so lucky, you know, uh, this chief doctor able to take you in you know so I went over to the Prince of Wales and this doctor is very nice and and again you know he explained much more detail uh, in terms because I'm under very high risk and then he told my husband that this is very rare case and uh, uh, I'm the first case you know so he said he also not so sure but he will assist me uh, uh, to help me for this pregnancy so what happened was <coughs> and but he he said that uh, if you can pass six months then that means your risk is uh, uh, lesser so what happened was when I came to six months uh, when I went for checkup the doctor said he just so amazed you know he just so amazed and look at me he said, you still okay, yeah? I said, yeah, I'm still okay. And in fact, uh, I felt my body is uh, getting better, more stronger, not like before, you know, before I would just have to lie down on bed, you know, every day, uh, felt tiring. But after I got a baby, you know, I was just getting stronger. <clears throat> so what happened was, uh, I able to to uh, to go to till nine months. So the doctor so amazed. Everyone they said they keep telling me, if you have anything, please admit yourself. <coughs> he said because I know that your lung will not be able to, you know, take it. Of course. So uh, what happened was, uh, uh, finally. You know, on the on the nine months, uh, the doctor wanted me to 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 go for operation earlier, uh, just two weeks earlier, uh, two weeks uh, earlier from the date uh, my my daughter supposed uh, to be born, right? So two weeks earlier. So I said, okay, then uh, after that, you know, operation done, and you know, the amazing thing what I saw was. In, in the hospital, you know, a trainee doctors came to me so surprised, you know. He read my profile. He said, you know, you are really a miracle. So I just take the opportunity <coughs> to share the gospel of Jesus to him. And he said, wow, it's truly. And also to share my heaven experience. He really, really amazed. And then after that, a group of doctors they came and then they just amazed the miracle. Then I told God, your name will be glorified. And I know that you love Hong Kong people. So 
we just have to hold on his, his, <coughs> his promise never never give up when he tell you you just have to hold on his word he will watch over his word and he will fulfill his word to you it will come to pass you know just uh that really encourages me, you know, because uh, as a husband, I say that I'll, I'll support your decision, whatever you're going to make, because it's a health, you know, it's a, it's a life and death, you know. But uh, we knew that when God, I say, you know, I also pray in God, you need to speak to my wife what, what you want her to do, you know. But it was amazing that day that she came back, she said, you know, God began to speak to me about feeding the 4,000. I'm like, hmm. Feeding the 4,000? What that got to do with the, you know, whether you want to keep the baby or not, you know? I was like, I couldn't just connect this thing, you know? <laughs> Feeding, like talking about food, you know? But it's just amazing how when, when he began to speak something, he said that, you know, I've done a greater miracle. I have already fed the 5,000. You know? What is that for me to feed the 4,000 now? You know, God has done a lot of miracles in the past. He has taken you this far. And one thing he wants to remind you, he will take you through all the way. Amen? Amen? So don't give it up so easily. He is able to do beyond what we could imagine or think. He says that to move the mountain, how big your faith need to be? Yeah, but every time people come and say, oh, you have a great faith. Like, you, know, you need to have a great faith to do this. I say, not really, actually. You know? <laughs> Say so just be practical because God, Jesus said that if you have a faith as mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain, right? He didn't say have great faith and then speak to the mustard seed. That's what we are doing, right? God, I need more faith, more faith. No, use what you already have. You know, I, I would say that my, my wife is not like 100% healed. I mean, like her, her lung function is only 30%. It's medically we have because of the cell. A lot of our cell is damaged. So they said it, this is soft tissues. It's already, it's already died. You cannot revive. There's scars in her lung. You cannot, there's no reversion. We knew there is a risk. But we're not trying to be heroes, you know, like, oh, say everything. You know, some people have this thing, you know, like, oh, God say, God say, and then the things don't happen. Hey, God, did you really say it? You know? You need to know that when you, when God shows you something. Sometimes you're not like fully 100% clear, but there's something only you will know. Like I told you, God wants us to, you know, when we came to Hong Kong, I, I have, my plan was to leave Hong Kong after three years. I say, God, when I finish my studies, I'm done with this place. I'm going home. I mean, home means to China, you know. <laughs> but God began to speak down the road. He said, that, son, I have a purpose for you to be in Hong Kong. Say, God, then you need to really show me what is that. Everybody told us, like, I think it's good, you know, with your wife condition, you go back to Malaysia, you know, like. So when the wife, my wife woke up, after 10 days, only she was able to speak. The first word she, she told me was, you know, by this time, I'm quite angry also with Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong, is what we got, she got sick. We were in seven years in China, nothing happened, we were perfectly fine. <laughs> we came here, this is like, you know, we are all, my wife is always sick here, you know. So I was like, oh, I'm done with this place, I want to go home already, like, go take my wife away. But when she woke up, she was able to speak. The first word she said, God want us to stay in Hong Kong. I was like, you have to be kidding me. After all these things happened, you still want to be in Hong Kong? You know, sometimes God will move towards what He want to fulfill in your life. Don't prematurely retract yourself before God fulfill what you have for you. Don't give up so easily. Because the one who leaves you, He is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who raised Jesus up from there. And today He is willing to raise your dreams up again. He is, again, He will do the great things that He have done in your lifetime. Sometimes not like signs and wonders. You know, something that what you are walking through at this moment, He can take you. You know, my wife has like tell you, it's not completely healed yet. But we are still standing on that promise that God will continue to heal her. She's already, I was like, sometimes even my wife struggles. You know, I'm still struggling. I say, you know what? You already gave birth to a baby already, you know. That is already amazing, you know. What else you want to prove? There's nothing to prove, you know. Your life is self a miracle. I tell you the third thing was that no matter what you have gone through today, He is with you. When the three guys went into the fire, the people who pushed them into the fire, they, they died, you know, they got burned. 
But King Nebuchadnezzar, after he thrown them, they were walking. It's like, wait, it's like, there's another person in there. How come there's four? We only push three guys in there. And he said, the fourth one looks like the Son of God. He identified, when you are going through a difficult time, although you can be complaining, struggling, but people around you, they see Jesus in you. They see, they can see Jesus walking with you. Don't give up so easily. The next thing we know that these three guys, he says that because they stand even against what the king have declared. You know, when the king declared, I mean, they, was, they were already dead. You know, they were pushing into a furry final, but he didn't die, came back. Now he said, anybody speak against this guy's God? He said, not only we, I just going to disappear you from the face of the earth, I'm going to destroy your household, everything you have, you'll be gone. Everybody worship these gods. Amen? Because people walking around you, they can see the God in you today. We're going to close here right now. and then Should we stand to our feet? Just close your eyes right now. Even as the music is going on in the back. But you know God as speaking to some of you. That he said that you need to channel your faith to be stubborn in the place where you need it. Today you need to trust me the things that I can take you through. It's not about you fulfilling what you can do. No, it's about what I can do through your life. God is asking you, will you be able to surrender that situation? Will you be able to surrender the bad news you have heard? Will you be able to surrender your circumstances? Will you be able to surrender your husband, your wife, your children? You think that the situation is so hopeless that you think that even God cannot do anything. Don't be stubborn with what you believe. But be stubborn on the word of God that what he is able to accomplish. Now just feel like you need to surrender today your situation. Just begin to speak to God right now. Let God take over, take control. That you are not pulling the handbrake so soon. Before until God says that he's, he's done with you. Because he said that he's not going to leave you nor forsake you. Last week, even when my wife was sharing this testimony, four people first time came into the church. They ran forward because they knew that this God is so amazing. They gave their life to Jesus. Today, there's something that God has spoken to you, to your heart. If you have never known Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity today to, to receive Him as your Lord and your Savior today. There is nothing impossible for God today. He is able today. He is able today. You know, if you need prayer, you can come forward right after we, we are finishing. I can pray with you. But if you need to go, you can go ahead and go. But if God, you know that He wants you to do something today, to step up. To step out in faith. Like Peter asked today, Jesus, command me to come. It's impossible task to walk on water. Nobody walked, only Jesus walked on water. And Peter saw that and Peter said that God command me to come not until God has commanded it to walk you don't step out don't go before God go with God walk with him and Jesus said come you know Peter just step out by faith he began to walk on that water he began to walk on that water and today God is calling some of you to step out in faith. There's a promotion coming your way but you need to step out by faith. 
that you are so dependent on your job to feed you rather than God to feed you and you know that God has spoken to you many a times that he said that it's time to let go because it's killing you it's killing your family it's taking the peace away from you it's just time to step out by faith I will provide I'm going to bring what you needed what is coming your way it's much more greater you are only seeing what what can provide for you right now it's a look further than what can happen God I just bring my dear brothers and sisters Lord right now those who who need healing right now Lord I speak healing right now in the name of Jesus over that pain in the name of Jesus be gone right now no more God I speak goodness over their sickness right now Lord come over them right now in Jesus name Lord the pain be gone right now Lord the lie the devil been speaking to them it's impossible that God they're, they're going to surrender to you know that uh, you're going to able to heal them we're not going to give up until you say so Father we're going to stand on the promise that Jesus you are still a healer you are still a miracle working God you can change my situation right now I mean you're not going to give up right now Lord so soon we're not going to give up until we give a really a bad time to the devil he need to know that we're not such an easy people to give in you can't be knocked down today but you're not knocked out yet you are still in the ring and God said rise up my daughter rise up don't give in anymore to the lies you are not weak you are strong but you are strong in me let your stubborn faith today rise up that you will stand on my word today to declare to your enemy the war is not over yet stand till you see the deliverance come thank you Lord Jesus I release your goodness right now Lord I release your healing right now I release your power right now Lord the power to make money right now Lord I pray for creativity be released Father God I pray for those who even need the visa for the next job God be released right now Lord I speak promotion for some of them Father in the name of Jesus Father God I speak Father God that there will be those who cannot conceive Lord right now let their womb right now be fruitful in the name of Jesus Lord I speak a reversal in the name of Jesus Father God because you are able to do today Lord in your timing Father God I thank you Lord I ask all this in Jesus precious name Amen Amen thank you shall we give him glory Hallelujah Amen